It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this event titled Flixbus and Greyhound, How Can David and Goliath Win Together? Great, enticing session. Uh, my name is Jenny Chapman. I'm a professor at Haas and the associate dean. I'm also the co-founder and co-director of the Berkeley Culture Center, which is co-sponsoring this event. Um, the Berkeley Culture Center generates and disseminates research that enables corporations to stay ahead of real-time challenges and sustain performance-oriented cultures as well as high levels of innovation. Um, and so we're, we're really pleased to be involved in this event. Um, and it's really why I'm so excited to introduce our speaker, co-founder and CIO at Flixbus, uh, Daniel Krauss. Um, and welcome to UC Berkeley. So uh, let me welcome the rest of you. Uh, we're all interested in um, joining you to share and hear your insights about merging organizational cultures and fostering innovation for a diverse workforce and consumer base. It's such an interesting story. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the swung, strong cooperation among the partners supporting this event. We appreciate the leadership of Andreas Altman, who I just met, um, rector and visiting professor at MCI, the entrepreneurial school in Austria, who connected us uh, with Daniel Krauss. Thank you so much for that. Um, we acknowledge as well the foresight of the Institute of European Studies in making this event possible. Institute Director Yuron de Wolf um, is, the, is moderating the event. Uh, my colleagues at the Haas Institute of Business Innovation, who are scattered around here, um, have also been instrumental in organizing the event. And we thank the Institute of Transportation Studies for co-sponsoring and promoting the event. Um, mergers and acquisitions are perhaps the trickiest strategic move for organizations. And um, it's, it's relatively straightforward to do the transaction and sign the papers. It is a whole other thing to actually ensure that the integration results in the aspirations that you had for the deal in the first place. So the success of the merger, from my perspective as a culture researcher, really does depend on not just those, those strategic decisions that you're making, but also your ability to integrate the cultures of two, in this case, very disparate firms. So today we'll hear from Daniel Krauss about how Flixbus has approached the challenge, um, what they've learned in a year and a half in their merger with Greyhound, and what his aspirations are for the future. Please help me in welcoming Daniel Krauss. All right, so hello all together. Um, thanks for having me. It was uh, quite a good coincidence as uh, we literally ended, but I come to that in a second, or you know, formal transaction in terms of integrating Greyhound this week. So it was just a trip from Dallas um, to here, even though I have to admit it at least didn't rain in Texas. Um, beside that, it wasn't uh, so warm either. So having, um, having taken, well, as the press stated, one of the most iconic brands um, last year, th that was interesting because um, I agree, Greyhound, I guess, is known by almost each and everybody here in the States. What some people didn't know, um, even for the last 20 years, it was not a real US business anymore. So it, it didn't change. We just, you know, we just took it over from a British corporate and think that we now can together build a better future as um, what we, in advance of the deal, figured is that the purpose and the dignity around serving the customers, the communities here in the US are much more similar, if not the same, between Flix and Greyhound as it didn't seem to be over the last years with uh, uh, their, their pre previous owner. So that said, um, and what still drives us, and even though if you dig into values, it might sound a little different, but at the end, the vision both of the companies have is to bring you know, smart and green mobility for everyone to experience the world. 
And the green in that perspective does not only mean it's green by color, but as it's shared transportation, it's so much better from a carbon dioxide footprint either compared to individual traffic. And obviously you can call, the ground is doing that for 100 years, more than 100 years now, and didn't really you know, think about that or put that in front of them. But apparently this is an important topic if we look ahead of us. And for everyone to experience the world is clear. While when Flix started a little bit longer than 10 years ago, for everyone to experience was to make bus travel or travel itself as easy as possible because of you know, digital assets, having an app or things like that. If you compare that to what Greyhound originally drove, it's just the pure connection, the play of connecting literally each and every municipality here in the US. So it makes people you know, being able to travel at all, which is not necessarily always the case because from an infrastructure and public transportation perspective, it's quite different here as it's over in Europe. And um, if I'd introduce the two players who just, you know, try to co-write co a future story of another combined hundred years, hopefully, and there's one of, uh, uh, there, there's first Flixbus, which eventually has been founded about 10 years ago by myself and my two co-founders um, back in Germany. We did that just because you know, we knew Greyhound, we knew similar services in the UK and somewhere else, and we always questioned ourselves, questioned ourselves, why is nothing similar present in Germany? And the reason is pretty simple in Europe, in Germany in particular, but in many other countries of Europe, um, it was just not allowed before 2013, because many of the countries really took quite an effort in investing into rail infrastructure and wanted to protect that after World War II. And therefore, they wanted to push out the private players out of the market or not even let them in. And in 2011, the European Union changed regulatory in order to open up the markets, and which sounds funny, but this time Germany was really, um, you know, kind of endeavoring on the first um, of these European countries to make that, um, to make that federal law and, and put it into, into their nation regulatory. And uh, we took that back then out of press because we knew we wanted to found something um, and it should have been something real, so not only digital, a digital piece of service. And uh, we literally read the press and thought, okay, transportation is huge. The market to move around people is kind of a mega trend that will become even more. And doing that in a manner which is not only relying on individual traffic could be, um, could be good. And if you compare Germany with other countries, well, obviously for cheaper and you know, affordable travel, so to say, there is room um, beneath the Deutsche Bahn, which is our railway company, and, and it's fairly expensive. You compare it with uh, Southwest from a service point of view, and even you know uh, have you know 50% on average more um, per mile you'd have to pay. So there was just a market we were able to address, and we uh, we did so and started the business. Um, the main difference between what Flixbos is known for in Europe and what, um, what Greyhound still is in the US is kind of the way we do services. So Flix, you could consider a franchise very similar to Hilton, running some stuff on their own, but some stuff uh, together with you know, mid-sized bus companies, which are all scattered around um, uh, the European continent. Um, why do we do though? Because we thought the underlying technology, understanding the demand um, and therefore managing you know, our supply in the best manner and interacting with the customer is something which was important for us. Not so much driving buses. There are you know, tons of companies around there doing that for 100 years like Greyhound and having mastered that. So you just have to mix and match. So Flix globally is rather considered um, an asset light platform. So a two-sided marketplace where we have to deal on the one hand with the customers and on the other hand with our uh, bus partners. Um, so in the beginning, even some said we are kind of like Uber. The difference is that we are really vertically integrated and are you know, kind of in charge of the services towards the customer. So if something goes wrong, um, it remains us. And on the other side, um, meanwhile, it's 110 years even. Um, it's one of the oldest bus companies in the world. When we started our business and people asked us, so what actually are you doing? We don't get it, buses? 
We back then, 10 years ago, took Greyhound as the example. And even if it's in Asia, not only in Europe, obviously also across the US, if you ask people about long distance bus services, this is kind of the cinnamon for what it means. Greyhound has been here forever. And two things happened over time. A, well, as some other companies also, it hasn't been managed terribly well in any of the decades. First, second, things change. You know, 100 years ago, um, services like Southwest didn't exist, so um, it's just, it was more prominent to take a bus. And, um, and C, you know, the pure focus around the customer, well, eventually got lost here and there. But the product itself still, you know, came up with more than 800 million USD turnover annually. So it's still, you know, tens of millions of people using Greyhound. Nobody would say, yes, I used a Greyhound because everybody's like, oh my God, this is something I don't do. And I heard rumors that even, this was the first thing when I told people, hey, we're taking over uh, rumors. Someone said like, isn't that uh, uh, taking over Greyhound? Isn't that the bus services where people's heads are getting chopped off in the back? I'm like, oh, okay. This is what you say about your, you know, one of your most iconic brands. But apparently that's kind of how bad the repetition was, eventually still is. Still, as I said, 800 million turnover annually means there's tons of people using the service in a manner which means the previous owner didn't take any invest over the last at least 10 years and um, obviously didn't really also know what it means, the purpose to move people around, the dignity to do the best for um, your customers. Um, if you take that medal of two sides, obviously, when we came to the table, we were the David, so to say, because only in the US, Flix was present for a little longer than three years. Um, not even 10% of the people of the population in, in the US know what Flixbus was. Um, and on the, other hand, on the other hand, everybody knew what Greyhound meant, even though nobody used it. Um, and it's been around for you know, one or 10 years. And you know, the, the fun fact is, each and every Hollywood movie kind of around transportation and, 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 and you know, going throughout America is touching Greyhound. When we took Greyhound over, we got a depot here close to LA with you know, a bunch of legacy buses like Oldheimer's just um, for the mean of uh, Hollywood purposes to have them um, in, in some movies. So that's different of the two companies. And actually what people then think, and that's kind of something what can happen after papers are signed, because I agree that's the easy one, is the question is how you combine cultures so it doesn't become against each other. You know, who is in the lead, who eventually follows, and what kind of situation is being recognized. And obviously, you know, the people we found here in Dallas are not only great people, but they really, you know, they, they had a certain purpose. They had a legacy. They were very proud of what they did. Um, and you have to respect that. So being on the ground very regularly and acknowledging their history and also making clear that all the efforts they took were great. Um, well, this is truly important in order to combine certain cultures. If they really feel being taken over um, and you know the young European folks know anything better at all times, well, that can quickly you know, go south, particularly if you look at the different cultures of our you know, continents, of the countries, the US and Germany. Um, it's always easy. We, we, when we took over, you know, companies in Asia with truly different cultures, that was more explicit. So here in the US, the challenge was to make sure not only the language determines if you work together, but so, so many tiny similar, uh, uh, things you have to take care of in order to, to bring those cultures together. And it all starts with just recognizing you know, the services the people did, they're proud and basically respecting their history and making that even part of our joint future. Um, but at the end, you can also question who in that case was uh, David and who uh, the Goliath in terms of, you know, we took them over. But apparently at the end, it's a little bit on the customer to determine. And that's also the main reason why I'm truly believing that this is going to be successful. At the end, what Flix 
brought to the table and was the reason to be successful over the last 10 years is a 100% focus of the customer in terms of understanding what their needs are. So what is the actual demand from where to where do customers want to travel on the one hand? What are the services on the other hand, like Wi-Fi on the bus, uh, on the bus uh, they, they really need to, uh, need to have in the meantime? And even if you now look around um, uh, getting tickets, is it more on the vending machine side or is it more on you know, uh, the e-commerce perspective, websites and app? That's something which uh, was 100% clear to us we needed to master. Um, and also, that was the only thing we had knowledge about and understood. We, like, before I co-founded Flix, I literally had no idea about bus services and transportation services in general. But I had idea, you know, how e-commerce would work, how you really try to understand with a supportive algorithm, you know, to bring things together and um, uh, what software is, uh, is all about. And on the other hand, if people look at transportation, it's ultimately important to have a decent network. You know, when we started over, we were hilariously cheap, sometimes even just one buck. Um, we did that to quickly grow and get a, you know, a large enough piece of the cake slash the market. In the meantime, people still think we're super cheap, but we're not. Also, Greyhound isn't. And it doesn't even matter. You know, if you want to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco, um, and there is no service offer. It doesn't really matter if Los Angeles, Las Vegas is one buck because this is not one you want to have. So even more important than the price is the offering. So apparently the network, the schedules um, in terms of transportation. And that's clearly something where here in the US, um, Greyhound remains the Goliath. Why? Because what you see on the right side is that nationwide network, which eventually takes you for decades to build up in a reliable way and in a cost-efficient way. It's easy to do the coasts, the trunk routes, Boston, New York's, um, because there's that much demand. But to master a certain network, which can also um, you know, offer the rest of the US decent services, is nothing easy. So this is what Graham brought to the table. And in that particular slide, you see also how it mixes and matches. They were not able back then to properly serve interconnections. Um, so it took forever and was just fixed. So if you decided you know, on, a certain, on a certain schedule with two, three, or four interconnections, um, you put a reservation of five or four um, available seats, you couldn't change. So if less people booked that, well, it was empty. If more wanted to book it, it just wasn't possible. So at the end, if you combine that, in the meantime, you know, we just uh, put all the schedules together, put our piece of software, like kind of a graph database, very similar how, you know, connections in social networks um, uh, work on top of that, and solved kind of, of, of that transportation riddle, and therefore not only connected the dots and make it more flexible, but eventually increased also the entire network, the possibilities we now can manage and also price from a revenue management point of view in the best way. Um, that's the one hand. And the other hand is trying to understand how traffic in general creates additional demand. Traffic is very much similar to, um, uh, to gravitation. So basically, if two large objects are close to each other, gravitation and traffic flows, it's simple to provide services. It's becoming more complicated if things are more apart and smaller. Um, and what we over the last 10 years came up with is some like flex gravitation constant, which basically even if we go into countries, um, that piece of software comes up with a suggestion, you know, how an initial schedule can look like. This is how we did recently um, Brazil, even though I have never, haven't never been to Brazil, no idea. Um, and um, that is what software can bring to the table, particularly in transportation, which in the past wasn't the case in these kind of, these kind of you know, tooling, so to say, the Greyhound folks just didn't have. What they also didn't have is a proper app. It was funny because uh, previous to the M&A deal, b before having signed the contracts, we obviously did some research on the financial side, which everybody does when taking over a company, but also on the product side. And we realized five, year, five years ago, they came up in press and released their new app. And you know, the press coverage was kind of like they literally invented something. I'm like, okay, I mean, that was way beyond the 2000s. I mean, around 2015, 
what's the news? Everybody had an app back then. There was even Uber already there. So um, that's what they didn't have. And um, what was normal for us to start with, because we didn't have in Europe 100 years to build up a network and a brand. We just needed something according to you know, a cheap price, something if you Google it, you in comparison would be up because of it's cheap and then eventually convert quickly. So you needed to have an app or a website which worked well to, to, to get that piece of the market of the cake quickly in Europe while we just didn't have those 100 years to build it up. And at the end, um, the truth is, it's not about David or Goliath. Eventually, also, if you don't, if you move, if you bring companies together, that M&A perspective, it's about recognizing the strength and the benefits of each of those companies being brought together. And it's about the customer and the perception of the customer, what they want, what the market needs, and to address that. And sometimes that means for the Flick services being imported into the US, they have been adjusted to the US needs. And on the other hand, some of what Greyhound over the last 100 years did just had to be upgraded to you know, the 21st century because it, it seemed here and there that they understood what the customer wanted in the 70s, but that might have changed um, towards today. At the end, it's about the easiest way to travel. And that starts with you looking for something, where you want to go, and getting that. That's very similar if you go to the large e-commerce players, like Amazon is the prime example. Everybody goes there, and it was cheap you know, years ago. It's not cheap anymore. It's a great service. You know you will be getting everything there. That's what it starts. Then you need a recent price, just a decent price, value for, for money. Um, and at the end, it just has to be easy. And what we will be working on in the next years together is not that tech and platform stuff, as we closed it out that week. but the, literally the services in the buses. So nobody will be telling me in 10 years from now, isn't that the brands where people get, people's hats were you know, chopped off? This is not the idea. It has to be, hey, I, I don't know, there was a bachelor party when we moved from LA to Vegas, and it was just great because literally the party started when we hopped on a bus uh, in LA and, uh, and not had to take you know, individual traffic um, and... Uh, just driving towards Las Vegas. That's kind of what um, is our joint vision. And um, that's true, particularly for the US, but also for Canada, for, um, for uh, Mexico. So Flix North America with both of the brands, um, I think will be very prospering and hopefully heading towards the next 100 years. Um, that's the idea. And therefore, you know, I'll be, I'll be here in Dallas more often to take care about what is most important. I agree with the Dean the culture itself to become unite. Um, and uh, therefore, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. That, that was wonderful. I think we had a wonderful introduction to the company, to your ideas. Um, but you know, we still have some time to go a little bit deeper. And, and maybe I, I would suggest mm. that we start a conversation with, with Andreas. And, and maybe just Andreas, before you start, uh, let me thank you once more for bringing Daniel to the Berkeley campus. And, and thank you for coming all the way from Innsbruck. And, and we're so glad about you know, this possibility for us to work together and to work on, on a partnership mm. with your institute in Innsbruck, Austria. Yeah, thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. We were really excited to hear when you uh, agreed to come to UC Berkeley to give a presentation on this uh, fascinating topic. Uh, and before I get started, I would uh, encourage uh, the, the audience uh, following us on the live stream to also bring in questions. This is why I have my cell phone, because the questions would come on my cell phone and I'll do my best to bring them in if possible. Sure. But now let me start with uh, my first question. 
now bringing such uh, uh, established and uh, different companies together. What was, if you're looking backwards, what was the biggest challenge, the biggest difficulty to overcome? So, um, if I look back uh, to the last uh, little bit more than one year um, after we signed uh, the papers, it, two things. First of all, you know, that kind of project, um, the the memories and all the experiences our grounds folks had concerning tech was always bad. Um, not only it started with you know not having taken any invest for the last 30 years, but also anything they tried to patch, um, you know, didn't work out. So when we another bunch of Europeans came in there and said like that's easy, we just you know flip that. They were like, all right, this is super complicated. This is a hundred years early. See, you certainly crash it. And it, not, it wasn't so much about them being afraid of crushing it, it was always about the customer. And that was the great topic about it, because you meant and you realized from day one on that their purpose around serving the customers, the communities here in the US was that strong. And that was you know, the underlying bridge, because it's the same as if you would ask all the Flixes in Europe, what they'd call. Um, so just not only taking their concerns and try to argue against, trying to understand, to identify what's the foundation in terms of really making sure we always you know, serve the customer well, and then build on top of that um, and trying to understand you know, their actual requirements and taking, taking them into consideration, making them part of the team and not only from the outside, try to you know, injecting something which eventually then can be pushed back as it obviously hasn't been invented there. Um, and that worked out well. So it was not um, the biggest achievement on Wednesday when we realized those e-commerce numbers really increased by 20% like conversion rate. The biggest achievement was that after you know two, three months of training, we got so much great feedback of our drivers. And some of them are you know averagely seasoned to say, so not you know a 20-year-old who is easy with an app. And they've been clapping applause and sharing videos how they checked and customers were being super happy. That was the greatest achievement because that told me um, now we're all on the same page and the rest is just execution. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Daniel, maybe before I ask my question, also wanted to inform people in the audience, if you have a question, raise your hands and we have a microphone ready uh, for you to also ask questions. And Daniel, but I wanted to go back to the very beginning uh, of your presentation where you made a connection between Flix buses and the color of the buses, right? Yeah. The color green, and, and the color green is obviously not by accident. It's, it's a statement, right? It's an yeah. environmentally friendly alternative to all of us individually driving our cars. But of course, there's emissions, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as you notice, there's growing concern about, about emissions. We, we have now uh, the EU Commission uh, proposing stricter rules also for buses, right? The so-called uh, Euro 7 standards. So, so how do you see this future? Do, mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you see a future in the direction of, of electric buses, mm -hmm. hydrogen? Well, how, how do you envision this? So um, we for now, and that means till you know, the late 30s, we'll see some um, combustion buses around. Mm -hmm. Obviously in a better standard, like you said, year seven. Um, but uh, this is given because the transformation will take a bit. The good thing is not only you share you know, the carbon footprint among 50 people, mm -hmm. we're working wherever it's possible also to use double daggers so you share mm -hmm. more or less mm -hmm. uh, the footprint among 80 people. That's the one thing. The other thing is looking into um, what kind of the new model can be. I'd say until this year it was unclear and therefore we tried out a bit. We have running, you know, uh, biogas buses in, in the Nordics, in Europe and in, in, in the Netherlands. We've used biodiesel um, and, and try that out to you know, decrease the footprint in, in France. Um, and here in the US, we have also next to, um, to, to France and, and one, one route in Germany, we have, we are most advanced in, in literally battery driven mm -hmm. um, EV buses. Um, and also have you know solar panel EV buses, you know, so different measures to not only um, see what reduces till the entire platform switch of that offline product, the emission, but also figuring out what will be the new platform then. And as I said, it was a little unclear um, till 2023. Now, 
I'm 100%, 99% certain um, that we'll be seeing battery as a superior technology. You know, many people said for some time it will be hydrogen, so fuel cell on the long distance. But the truth is, um, you know, you'd also need to have electricity to, to get to the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And more steps are less efficient. And eventually you need that hydrogen in industry, just much more than transportation. And the only challenge you had, had to, to solve, so the riddle was around the batteries itself, to become more efficient, long-lasting, and eventually not as heavy. And uh, there were a couple, couple um, you know, milestones, all those ventures around um, a battery EV cracked over the last month, and therefore it became almost 100% certain we will be seeing um, battery-driven EV buses around. But to become really, um, and that not only to, from an industry perspective, but also now from a very individual company perspective, to become uh, really 100% carbon dioxide neutral, that will take, um, and it's rather around the 40s than in 2030. Um, um, what we do is we, um, we made ourselves um, part of uh, the official UN uh, charter and committed to the SGDBI targets, so scientific-based um, uh, targets, to really actively work on bringing it down. Um, but until we really hit the target to become net zero, it's rather in the 40s than the 30s. Thank you. Uh, before I bring in my next question, I should repeat uh, the where uh, the uh, questions can be brought in. Uh, the address is lifetalk at mci.edu. So I'll repeat it, lifetalk at mci.edu, and they would come up on my screen. But now to my, to my question. Now, uh, looking at Flix and uh, looking at uh, Greyhound, what do you see is the biggest bottlenecks in both institutions? Is it uh, people? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, finance? Is it culture? Is it technology? Is it whatever? <laughs> is it IP? I, I, I think um, the answer to the question is changing. Um, and, you know, in the early, in the early month of the pandemic, I eventually, I would have answered and said, like, uh, customers, and that can conclude in finance and in, in money. Um, now, when uh, thanks God pandemic is over, um, well, our, our greatest constraint is people in terms of bus drivers. Mm -hmm. So we'd rather be supply constrained these days, both in Europe, but sorry, even more in the US than anything else. So it's not, you know, IP and technology and also our internal people, I don't have any doubts. Um, that works well. But literally all of our great uh, blue collar colleagues, uh, you know, doing the actual job, um, they, some of them are, they, they, they left, um, they left uh, the market, maybe having retired or whatsoever, don't know. And similar challenges all across the world. Um, and that's, that's currently our, our biggest constraint. So supply mm -hmm. um, by, by um, missing drivers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah. Um, we have a question in the audience. So why don't we give, uh, how do we organize this, Chris? We have a microphone yeah. in the back. So if you would just walk to the microphone and ask yeah. your question there. And please just introduce yourself briefly, who you yeah, are. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ash. I'm a student here at UC Berkeley in the Management Entrepreneurship and Technology Program. And so the question that I have that I'm intrigued about is how has this affected research in R&D maybe into autom autonomous bus driving mm -hmm. vehicles, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Good one. So uh, obviously um, autonomy at some point will affect us. Um, and obviously that could be part of, um, you know, cracking that riddle uh, concerning the bus drivers, because if it's a scare resource and it cannot have all the supply needed, um, that's difficult, um, because at some time, if you're heavily undersupplied, you may lose um, market share, and you may embrace competition, which, in, you know, competition is great, but not because you can't deliver. Um, so part of the solution, to see full autonomy um, you know, maybe also in a time frame close to carbon neutrality, so beyond 2030. Why? Because only in some areas like Waymo and Phoenix, that wouldn't help us out. 
you know, we have a sterilized product all across the world uh, now in 41 countries. Um, you know, next year, another two, three or four countries will eventually join the, the map. And that means if I only, I don't know, be able to run those buses in Arizona, I'm nice, but not uh, solving my challenge. And that will take more because of regulatory. I mean, people acknowledged uh, by shutting down some of these startups that it's generally more complicated, but I have no about a technology. I never had. It's more about regulatory. Um, and what I can imagine in the meantime is combining certain levels. So the assistance systems are very high advanced already. We will be heading towards uh, more autonomy. And what is uh, being tried in Europe in the meantime, I just don't know where we are in the US there, is uh, remote controlled basically. So if remote controlled drivers, um, uh, which is also a benefit already because then drivers do not have to you know, sleep outside and you know, it's, it's the, 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 the scheduled services, it's, it's all just more comfortable and you can then um, uh, you know, just remote control buses. And if you think one uh, ahead and mix certain levels of autonomy with remote control, that can mean um, you know, if you are in a city like San Francisco, it's being remote controlled to the highway and let go on the highway because it's way easier for AI to, to deal autonomously on, on highways or Autobahn in, in, in Germany. And once you're uh, uh, approaching another city slash stop, you someone remote control will take over. This is something I can see earlier in the rather, you know, late 20s, early 30s, full autonomy. I, I'm very much close to where I think uh, we will reach carbon neutrality around more towards the 40s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Exciting. Um, Daniel, I had a question uh, for you uh, about the reputation of Greyhound. You, you alluded to it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to share with you a, a reference, a personal reference to it. I, I grew up in Europe when right? I came to America a couple of years ago, so I, I'm not that familiar with, with Greyhound. And I asked my colleagues at the Institute of European Studies, what's the reputation of Greyhound in the United States? And, and they first smiled and then they started to laugh. And, and that was, of course, you know, uh, uh, significant, right? Um, <laughs> but my question to you is, is, is the following. Um, a person like you, right, being European, interested in, in this American company, how do you inform yourself? about Greyhound before making that decision to actually you mm -hmm. know, purchase the company? Did you, did you come here incognito and traveled around on Greyhound to kind so, of see how it so works? What did you do to, to learn about the company? A couple That's things, a couple things to answer the question. Not all, you know, on purpose concerning the deal. I used to live in Detroit for three years and, um, you know, the first time I was in the US, I think, was when I was four or so. And throughout that period of time, relatively regularly on the ground, which means I had an idea about ground. I even traveled that couple times already um, from Detroit on first. Second, um, we started the Flix services because the U.S. is among the largest, uh, uh, you know, long-distance coach markets in the world. So we had to start our services for multiple reasons. We obviously back then didn't know that we one point in time we'll, we'll have the chance to acquire Greyhound. B, another European company, um, Megabus, started their services here. And C, we were terribly afraid because of the, the size of the market and being more unified than in Europe. If a copycat would have been popped up and being able to really you know, uh, grow fast and large and, and, and conquer the US market, that would have been a, a, a real threat towards us because with that, you know, power of the market coming to the European continent, could it become serious? So we thought to prevent that, we started our services four or five years ago as Flix North America. Um, and obviously there in competition with Greyhound, with Megabus, um, with some of the local Chinese buses in, in the East Coast, we gained experience in competition, what um, worked well, what didn't work well. Um, you know, as I earlier uh, uh, mentioned in the pre-discussion, and we realized in our first services, uh, LA to Las Vegas, that around 90% 90, 90 of the Flix customers never even traveled with ground. Yeah. And you, you think of like, this is the same service, you're taking a bus from A to B, but um, there's that many. And that two things that uh, not only um, you know, gave us some certainty what we have to improve and manage around the reputation, but also that um, there is still potential 
on that market on top of what Greyhound was already. Um, and, and that's great because, you know, then you know you have, you have growth potential. Just one short follow-up question. Did you consider at all dropping the name and, and just changing it completely? Yes. One big we, flip, yes, flip yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. And two things. We thought because of the reputation it might be that bad that it's more a harm than anything mm -hmm. else. But there's a saying, even better reputation is at least reputation. And um, it's, it's very similar to like in Europe, you said, uh, having grown up there, you know, everybody hates Deutsche Bahn, everybody. But also 99% of the people in Germany, which is 80 million, know what it is, what it does. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was very similar here. So, and we decided to rather um, manage around the repetition. And some of them we already knew we were going to bring to the table at day one you know, all the technology pieces and uh, being perceived as a 90s player rather than a 21st century player. Um, and that's one thing. And the other, the, the, the other thing is that we, we were lucky. We had in 2019, uh, we took over the Turkish market leader, also a 100-year-old brand. And when we did that, we recognized, even though it's the same services, we didn't know Turkey well enough. Now, I guess we knew the US better, but what that teached us is like, you know, be even less arrogant than you think. Mm -hmm. um, so we were even more cautious mm -hmm. about, you know, and the reputation is also third party, you know, talk to third party people. And then only having taken two rides is not enough. So we were like, hey, would I change Coca-Cola if I just, so, and then the obvious answer was rather no. What we clearly did and started from day one on is separating the brands. Mm -hmm. So we can serve those 90% of the people eventually have never used a, a Greyhound and just attract them to Flix. Um, and on the other hand, you know, uh, keep and improve the services to the people who, who've been grown up with Greyhound forever because they may even not have an alternative. Um, Thank you. Yeah. We have a question in the audience. Yep. Uh, Chris. Hi, Chris Bush from the Institute for Business Innovation. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the slide you showed about some of the new services you're planning to offer. Could you maybe talk a little bit about your customer discovery process, both in Europe and in the US, and how you've merged them to determine what customers are, are looking for? Yeah. So um, basically, what we do is um, we try to understand our customers on, on all the touch points we have. So that can start with a regular surveys. You'd push out, you know, um, via, via uh, your, your e-commerce touch points and interfaces, but that can be also um, on the buses at the stations. Um, and, um, and then try to prioritize and weight those and eventually compare with the other regions um, also to have a proper prioritization because obviously we have, it's not a constraint, but still limited resources and we have to make sure we come with features according to um, what is, you know, not only individual highest customer need here in the US, but eventually the global highest customer need because we decided to go with a single inventory strategy. So if you, you know, register, book a ticket here in the US, fly to Europe on vacation, it will recognize you and then, you know, you book on the same system. Um, and therefore, we have to balance uh, globalization and regionalization, uh, regionalization uh, quite a bit and try to identify um, the individual buckets of customer needs throughout, you know, surveys, hanging around at stations, um, and then balance that across the entire world, um, what will be the most important service to come up with. Um, and. Um, as simple as as simple as uh, as we had that early early up, we now will um, you know change our Wi-Fi infrastructure almost globally because um, it's simple, but that is it's just a must. It's delay on time performance, friendliness of the driver, and um, the Wi-Fi connection. So friendliness of the driver sounds obvious, but it's super complicated. You have to train them, you know, make them aware of anything needed. The on-time performance, I think we can 
already start working on with the additional platform services we brought to the table and have migrated Greyhound on top of. So, and the, the single most other relevant topic is Wi-Fi connection, connectivity, and that's something we're now working on, um, which is not a real feature, but it's still, this is, this is huge. People just want to be connected. Yes, before we go back which, to which actually also applies to universities. You can deliver the best <laughs> service if Wi-Fi doesn't work, you are dead. Uh. Uh, Andreas, before we go back to you, I, I see we have another question in the audience. And so if you wouldn't mind going to the microphone, so people. Hi, I'm Michael Postel, Austrian Consul General here in uh, Los Angeles and the West Coast. Thank you very much for very interesting seeing also combination of European and US companies and that brings me to my questions when you look and you mentioned the regulatory environment when you compare the US and the European regular uh, environment regulatory environment uh, what is your assessment and maybe to add up to that because you mentioned uh, the future will be uh, electronic vehicle batteries uh, and we as diplomats are very much looking into the impact, also as diplomats, on the RIA and the Green Deal. So would that have an impact uh, for your company uh, yeah. in yeah. the future? Yeah. Thank you. So um, I start with back. The Green Deal has an impact because um, I think it was a necessity to have framework in Europe to really you know, support initiatives. In, in the past, we are not an OEM, we don't produce buses. In the past, we always had the challenges with any other great idea we had. The large manufacturers said, like, yeah, nice idea, but this is just, there is no, why should we? You know, it's, I look at Martians, and what you do is just uh, investing, and it's, it takes forever, and I just build another combustion engines because it's easy to. So that was important from a framework perspective, the Green Deal, big fan. Um, obviously, and that's, the other answer in terms of regulatory that clearly shows not only in transportation and any other industry the advantages of a united large market you can address and that's also true with the IRA I mean Europe has been put billions on the table to overcome COVID I don't know not even 10% or so is withdrawn so it's not a problem of money um, and at the end, it's a problem because it's a mess of certain federal, state, and even, you know, country level, uh, which is not the case here. It's just two-layered federal and state, and, um, and not three-layered even. And, um, and it's a clear market. So we don't, we address uh, 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 the same size of the market with one single regulatory adjustment into our world, into our company, into our systems, while in Europe we'd have 30-something or so adjustments to deal with. And just from a cost perspective, to run that profitable, it's a mess. Um, and, you know, if people talk about diplomats and, you know, politicians talk about, I agree, we, had, we need to have, um, uh, to re-bring up, you know, those um, cross-Atlantic um, uh, trade agreements. They should solve their trade agreement stuff in Europe first. That would be a large enough market. I mean, I'd love the Americans to have on board, but you know, why just don't they unify the market first? Um, so that's, that's my answer to that. Um, and that was also the answer why we had to make sure we are the leader in the US. If not, if someone becomes leader in the US, the market wave, they can be surfing. If that swaps over to, to Europe, it's hard for the overregulated you know, industry, independent of its transportation, something else, to, to fight against, and you do not want to fight against. You want to serve the customer and not, you know, maintain regulatory needs. Mm -hmm. So that becomes po politics. Or something. We have two questions in the audience, so maybe we start with you, and then we go to. Hi, um, Slav Hermanovic, Berkeley faculty. I actually tried to use the link, Andreas. I uh, saw it. So you were you were in my in my in okay. my list. Okay, so I'll ask in person. Uh, you operate essentially two bus companies uh, in two very distinct geographic areas. What uh, are the differences between customers' uh, expectations and customer drivers uh, if, and that presumes that yeah. Europe can be treated as one area? Yeah. Probably not. But what can you tell about, uh, you know, why, mm -hmm. why people want to mm -hmm. drive, take these buses mm -hmm both in uh, the green one and the yeah. blue one. 
So um, beside those st standard topics like on-time performance of the Wi-Fi I mentioned, in Europe it's clearly focused on more, you know, you could state younger people um, because olders wouldn't even know that there is bus services. I mean, it's just 10 years prior to that, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. While age determi doesn't determine so much here in the US, it's more, you know, where you live and uh, what part of the society you belong to. So it's affordable travel um, and uh, people who eventually, you know, uh, take private jets, I don't think I'll see too often in my buses. Um, and, um, and therefore age determines more in Europe just because prior to 10 years ago there was nothing. While where you live and to what piece of society you belong to determines more here in the US. Beside that, what people look for and wish for is very similar. If you then even move over to Turkey, there are additional different needs. You know, we had, that sounds super odd for Europeans and Americans, but we had to implement gender seating mm -hmm. in, in Turkey. Um, um, and it's not about, okay, we, we balance priorities because outside the Turkish market, that it just was not not a priority. They just would not have used our product at all without the possibility to select if a woman took that seat, only another woman can take the other seat. Um, and um, so that's something where if we further grow and go to you know, other markets, we have to determine some must, regional must-haves. Um, but that uh, didn't, uh, you know, didn't hold true between Europe and the US. There it's more you know, age versus where you live and what part of society you belong to. Question. There's a microphone right next to you. Hi, um, my name is Naomi Leventhal. I'm a student here at Berkeley majoring in conservation and resource studies. So I have actually taken Flix buses a couple times. Um, obviously, like over there, we have I like know. Crescent you, Lane like, and it's you fantastic. see stuff all over the place. Yeah. Love it. Um, and I've come across actually an interesting conundrum when I've taken Flix buses myself, which so my hometown is in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I've had this thing where I'm navigating between the cost and emissions, which I think are two very important factors mm -hmm. as like a college student who does kind of have mm -hmm. to regularly go back and forth. Um, but then also the amount of time that it takes mm -hmm. to spend on a bus. Um, you know, it's about nine hours because you have to go like further to go into San Jose. And then like the way that they're like, you know, traversing across California is slightly different than if I hop into a car with one of my friends mm -hmm. and take the five. Or if like over Thanksgiving break, I was like, okay, comparable price. I can go on an airplane and it mm -hmm. only takes an hour. But it's an airplane. You know what I mean? That's not very mm -hmm. like good environmentally and I would much prefer to just get on a bus but when it takes nine hours sometimes I'm just like not willing to invest the time so how do you balance between like you know the environmentally friendly side of it the number of stops that you have to make and then the amount of time that a customer is willing to put in like that's something that you know for me I sometimes it, 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 it's, it's a balance past. because it's, I mean, it's generally more environmental friendly as an individual car, but only if it's filled up. Mm -hmm. And to get it filled up, you need to have a certain route, including several stops usually, um, which, you know, obviously also um, results in a longer, you know, a longer amount of time while riding. And at the end, um, the truth is, we stand for the green color and being as environmental friendly as possible. But to be sustainable means also as a privately owned company, you have to run your company sustainable. If not, it either go bust or I, I make myself dependent of others and then they decide how environmental friendly I'll be. So at the end, um, we always look to get buses loaded because that's the only way to run that profitable. And that will determine the rest. Um, and the rest is then, um, that takes a certain amount of time just because of the stops you'd, uh, you'd incorporate. Um, and usually it's just then, you know, an effect that um, we're pretty sustainable because sharing among many people. Um, but uh, at the end, filling up the buses is the, the first determination. And uh, second, that could result in, uh, in then longer uh, times you'd have to take, and obviously has a good 
um, impact on, on the carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, if we realize that, you know, for instance, uh, our reputation and how many people know us increase, we eventually reduce stop or decouple it. So it's individual roads with individual um, decently full buses um, that would uh, over time uh, increase, um, in, increase the time or decrease in that case, uh, just improve it. Um, we've seen that uh, multiple times already, but not there yet. It depends a little bit um, where we are. So yeah, you know, be, having full buses in order to being able to make money is the first, the rest is to follow. Uh, I keep uh, getting questions coming in, question after question, so I feel a bit bad that, that I've encouraged it so much, <laughs> but, but uh, let me do my best to, to at least uh, bring in some, some of them. Now, the one about uh, autonomous driving and uh, Flix uh, buses or, or Greyhound has already been answered, I assume. Uh, now, another one is uh, coming in from uh, Marcus Frischert, he's a faculty member, he holds uh, the uh, Jean Monnet chair at uh, our institution at the MCI. And he asks, uh, now, thanks for the inspiring talk. Are there countries where you think your concept, e.g. the one of Flixbus, could work even better in countries where you think it would not work at all? So the only countries where it doesn't work is where it's not allowed mm -hmm. to work. So if it's regularly still, um, um, you know, for different reasons, not uh, being freed up, um, in Europe, Spain is a prime example. Mm -hmm. So you don't see domestic flex buses in Spain because we're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and even though we started in Brazil, um, we're still waiting for some um, certain steps to be accomplished. There was a huge promise and they're working on it. it takes longer as always in, in politics. But uh, therefore, our, our growth in Brazil is currently limited just because of regulatory. So the only reason why, why it wouldn't work is regulatory. Mm -hmm. um, in countries where I think, you know, if it depends on the infrastructure. So if there are countries with less train infrastructure, that's always a booster. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and obviously compared to the population. So India, for instance, has train infrastructure compared to the populations, nothing compared with Austria or Germany. Um, so I can, uh, I can imagine that could work. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I may come in with an additional one. I mean, I, I enjoyed your, your response regarding uh, the US-European uh, trade agreement uh, that uh, Europe has enough, uh, let's say, potential to, to overcome. Anyway, um, and I, I hope uh, many European citizens and, and administrators in the Commission are listening, <laughs> although it is more a national issue mostly than a, a European uh, Brussels one. But now, uh, I see a question coming, from, coming in from uh, Pablo Perez Iliana, I hope I to pronounce it correctly, and he works at least uh, telling from the address at the European Commission. And his question goes, now from, uh, from your operations in the US and in the European Union, what could the EU learn from the US and uh, vice versa, what could the US learn from Europe? So what I think Europe does well is and I'm, you know, I grew up in Europe, so that's a little bit biased, I have to admit. <laughs> but um, uh, what Europe does is making sure almost nobody, if he or she doesn't want to, is left behind from a societal mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy that. That's, that's good. Um, and this is also what drives me as an entrepreneur. And I know each and every, almost each and every entrepreneur here I know in the US um, has been driven by the same. Um, but sometimes, and, and they fill the gap partly, but uh, you know, sometimes um, it seems that, and you know, just taking that anecdote, I was running in San Francisco downtown yesterday, and the last time I was in San Francisco was pre-pandemic, and downtown didn't get better, let's say it like that. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something you can do as a society represented by a government, and there uh, I, I see, I personally see advantages in Europe. Um, to the spirit which is here in the US, I think from day one on, is to drive, to change, to do something. 
Um, so the entrepreneurial spirit, which we try running around to educate people with in Europe, in Germany, you know, hey, why don't you, you know, start something up? This is something which is way deeper part of the DNA to, you know, not only talk about what doesn't work and how we can, you know, prevent things working, but, you know, just identify a problem, work on it, solve it, and, you know, sometimes you may have to regulate it later, eventually, but uh, uh, the spirit to, you know, get things done, get over uh, certain th things that's, it's so much more vibrant here in the US and not only in the valley but all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. um, and that's a fine balance because if you are responsible for your own life and fortune, I think you can maintain that original spirit when the, you know, the, the, the US, um, um, you know, just centuries ago uh, kind of uh, uh, was in corporate and you eventually lose that spirit if you're mm. always helped out by the government. So it's a fine line um, mm. because even though I said this is what Europe does great, if I would be the US, I would do also quite a bit to not lose that spirit. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, you can just move to Europe. That's mm -hmm. easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there was a question also in the audience, if I was not mistaken. From you, right? If you would ask a question. Hi again. I was wanted to circle back, I think, to one of your questions, which was kind of talking about um, airplanes and budget travel that way. Um, I'm curious to hear about how Flixbus kind of thinks about its strategy in comparison to these budget airlines, um, and in mm -hmm. terms of, I guess, convenience, yeah. et cetera. So, couple couple layered answer. First of all. Um, we do not only do domestic, but also um, cross-border. This is usually quite an advantage, even if you compare ourselves with Southwest. First of all, we also are able to serve certain communities which, uh, even with Southwest in the U.S., have n not any close airport towards to. Moving over to Europe, there also the Green Deal and things around that support us. You may have read that in France, for instance, um, you know, domestic flights uh, uh, have been forbidden as long as a decent um, high-speed rail connection exists, uh, just because as long as you know the, the airline industry has not a good idea about you know carbon dioxide challenge, um, that's something which is supportive um, for us um, in Europe. So it is competition. Fun fact: it's more competition here in the US than it's in Europe. Um, but I think um, we're positioned. <laughs> To, to deal with that decently. So um, overall, there is still more in the US, how we stated car or couch, so people don't travel at all because they hang around Netflix, or the individual cars. And in Europe, the, beside car, it's, you know, trains. It's just, you know, state-owned uh, railways. This is the, the largest competition here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would have a number of questions and uh, also on my little uh, sheet of paper, but uh, there is one coming from Gabriel Brandstetter. He studies international business, uh, business and law at the MCI and it goes, are there any plans to make Greyhound business, the Greyhound business more asset light in the future? Um, it kind of happened already through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of that, um, as I said, uh, when we, you know, took the Flix brand to the drunk routes, that's mm -hmm. in the standard Flix model. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of happened already. But some will just um, stay as it is, mm -hmm. because if it's a good deal, um, also together with the regional governments uh, to make sure all the communities stay connected, then it's fair. I don't believe in the concept of acid heavy versus acid light. This mm -hmm. is, th this is, you know, uh, uh, 2000s, you know, when, when all those Ubers and platforms appeared. At the end, I believe you have to have a certain level of vertical integration um, so you cannot become redundant. And therefore, in our case, I'd call it rather an acid right mm -hmm. um, concept. And that's what we try to maintain depending what is needed. Mm -hmm. 
Now, may I bring in a question coming from a different background? We are now sitting uh, at Haas School of Business, and the students, especially students, but also faculty members are around. Now, out of your experience and your uh, needs uh, as an entrepreneur, what would you think uh, universities would have to deliver more? Uh, what is lacking? What is, uh, is there certain expectations towards universities uh, to more, better serve the, mm. the, the, the society or to be, to be more entrepreneurial or to also support the careers? The truth is that's not easy to judge for multiple reasons. A, it's been a while when I graduated. B, I obviously have a closer insight into European universities. Um, you know, when I used to live in Detroit, um, and, and back then that was challenging during automotive crisis, and I thought uh, if it's a good idea to take an MBA, I, two things I recognized back then, and that's, you know, 2007, eight or so, uh, the, the, the curriculums were quite business focused. So the, the topics we addressed earlier today, you know, uh, culture, um, you know, business ethics seem to be a little bit underrepresented. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that changed. Um, and obviously I believe education is the key principle to solve humanity's challenges. Yes, education and entrepreneurship, but if you have no idea, no education about what entrepreneurship means, well, you'd, you'd not end up there. Um, and that becomes particularly true also if people shoot at each other. This mm -hmm. is usually because they have no idea what, how, how, what different measures, better measures, mm -hmm. you have to solve your problems. Um, and then, obviously, you need both. You need excellent education, um, like at MCI or in Stanford, mentioning those two because they're private. But you also need, um, um, you know, the ability to have education to all of the people who are in need and who want that. I know also here in the U.S. with scholarships and the support and being in, at the UC, which is, you know, just you know, public, mm -hmm. this is great. Um, but that's something where I think, um, you know, even more can be done. And uh, in Germany and Europe, again, in most of the cases, Entrepreneurship, in particular, is totally underrepresented. Mm. I've had no clue, uh, not after uh, when I graduated from high school, nor when, um, uh, when I did my uh, undergree, even in master's, no. Essentially, I've no, had no idea um, what that means to, to run a business when I, mm. when I graduated. Mm. I bring in a question from a UC Berkeley student, which I have on the screen, on the screen to not just represent the MCI. Now, Travis Fraser, he's a UC Berkeley student, uh, sent me the following question. Can you explain the logistics of the merger in regards to existing Greyhound infrastructure, mm -hmm. so, such as hubs, physical locations, mm -hmm. as well as staff? Mm -hmm. So the staff is easy because that's needed, um, particularly the staff, um, you know, on the ground, blue collar, so to say, whether it's clerks or drivers needed, easy. Um, it's just a ma matter of training. In terms of the infrastructure, um, well, uh, this is a project uh, which is currently going on. You know, some of those Greyhound stations, uh, they, they really look like in the 70s and are very great, costly, like, you know, business class air, uh, yeah. airport launches. And what we ask is, as I said earlier, is that what the customers value? And if the answer is no, we have to uh, find different solutions. Yeah. You know, some of the most successful stops in the US are curbside stops. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't an on-purpose decision to do that in New York as a curbside stop, um, because it just works and people want to have it centrally and safe, so with, you know, light yeah. and, uh, and, and proper eventually in New York pu public transport connection, but they wouldn't care whether it's Port Authority or no. Mm. Um, Port Authority is uh, not the best example because this is just, you know, aside of, uh, aside of uh, the main train station, uh, central station, uh, the area where you'd go to, and, and we eventually put all of our stuff there because we couldn't um, uh, before the merger, but um, wherever it's not um, reflected by the customer, 
willingness and what they what they would like to need, we'd rather reconsider um, how large the stations would have to be. Mm -hmm. um, what we learned is we never had a good ticket vending machine solution in Europe, mm -hmm. so we are now taking the US one, which works perfect. They just uh, injected our system, and um, that means we may roll out more of them. Um, and then we only have to take care about that's the, the prime the prime requirement is it has to be safe or at least perceived like uh, it's being safe um, and not necessarily any lounge stuff and super fancy things so that's something we're working on to determine where which is the case and then eventually change um, stations to a more cost efficient but at the same time more customer focused approach mm -hmm. excellent yeah um, Daniel that would be my, my last question uh, for you um, so we spoke a lot about about customers, about directors of the company. We haven't spoken much about about the drivers, right? And and when you think about the customer experience, when you think about complaints, right? The driver plays an essential role in all of this. So what do you look for when 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 you when you hire drivers? When, what do you look for when you train drivers? What is important? To you? So the driver is the most important single piece in our world. Um, you may have to keep in mind that this is a complicated job mm -hmm. um, and you don't have as much technical support as in pilot and you're much more exposed to the customers mm -hmm. and um, it's not as fancy and you don't earn as much. Um, so this is just, they're, they're my personal heroes and what we look for is that they do that job on purpose. They kind of fall in love mm -hmm. um, for different reasons. For some, it takes longer because they have taken a training to become a driver and um, used to be something different prior. Um, for some of them, they feel the responsibility and eventually uh, were drug, uh, drug drivers, but now want to take care about people rather than goods. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end, it's all about that they fall in love and, and, and have a certain passion. Um, and, and that's something which is, you know, this is even more prominent here in the US as in, in Europe, because in Europe we had to create that, also that common sense of passion, the, the common culture as in that kind of, you know, rather partnership and franchise model, they're being, you know, employed with all of our partners here in the US. Our, Greyhound drivers, they are just proud of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that helped us also in the recent times when uh, drivers became a scary resources because we were able to call here and there uh, our drivers who already retired and they were like, yeah, of course. Um, I did that my, my entire life and I just, this is what I want to do. Um, and um, that's great. You need to have that passion because it's just a super hard job and if you don't love it, um, um, you can't handle that. I mean, people, as we know, when we're traveling, it's a stressful thing to travel, and we can uh, we can make it as comfortable as possible. But at the end, things go wrong. Your connection is lost. You know, it's raining. Right? It's it's always a mess because at the end, what you want is to reach your destination. This is the reason why you travel. Nobody says like I'm, some of them are running around in buses because they love it. Maybe, but 99 percent more, almost 100 percent, go there because they want to you know, reach their destination. Mm -hmm. And that means even the little things create stress. And these people are there to make sure it's as comfortable as mm -hmm. it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and people feel safe and, um, and not only feel safe, but obviously uh, you know, the services uh, they provide um, uh, is, is uh, done safe. So this is just um, awesome. Therefore, you, you have to look out if, if they really, if they love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. That was my final question for you, but I will go to uh, Andreas to. to actually, we I think we need to come to an end, uh, mm -hmm. but I have a, a double double final sure. question. I mean, I, I, I uh, anyhow have to keep in the build, uh, stay in the building for a while because I mean, you know, it's better. <laughs> it's There's nothing better. I, uh, <laughs> Actually, we shouldn't confess that it's raining out there. Uh, we're in beautiful, sunny California. Uh, mm -hmm. I th sh can we take the question in the sure. audience still? Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm an engineer working at Haas for the Institute of Business and Innovation, and I have just one last question, sorry. 
Uh, my question is, why do you think uh, Greyhound wasn't working? Like, why do you think it has such a bad reputation after all? Um, the main reason is, well, there are multiple main reasons. I think they didn't know. I think they, um, they just didn't know for different reasons because it changed over time. In the past, it was an icon, it worked. And then it, it stopped working because you know, the previous owners eventually didn't take any invest to make it better. So they had to run buses which are older than I am. And the same is true for their core inventory management system, so their tech. Um, and then, you know, you still think oh, everything is great. I, I, I come up with an anecdote. I used to play volleyball, decent. Um, I had to stop because of my knees. And when I stopped, I still played quite good. 15 years later, my brain still thinks, this is how you play. The last time I was on court was eventually the last time I was on court because that was a very painful experience. Um, as uh, my body told my brain, and my brain no, that time is over. Um, and there I had the direct feedback of my body. Greyhound, in that period of time, you know, the 90s, I, uh, 90s, they didn't even have the tooling, not the direct feedback. They, they just, they, they had no surveys, they had no um, idea, mm -hmm. and then they just kept on going, and then they lost their customers, and, um, and didn't, you know, they're stuck in, in their own uh, legacy. Um, so not on purpose, just because the outside didn't give the support, as that the owners didn't take the invest. And therefore, even tooling was missing to really make sure they are able to identify what changed. Um, so that's about it. So it wasn't on purpose. They all, I, all of the people I got to know in Dallas, even on day one, they loved their stuff. Um, and it was never on purpose. Um, it was just an accident because nobody took care. I try to avoid comparisons to universities now. But uh, my, my uh, final question is a double one. The one is, uh, you have uh, students sitting in here in the audience and also listening uh, via on the live talk, on the digital one now. What kind of advice would you give to these young people to be successful or to have a decent life or whatever comes <laughs> into your mind uh, what, but what would you what kind of advice would you give and the other one which, which goes perhaps a bit together is what is your biggest dream your personal biggest dream so I'm far not in a position to give advices but when we talked about bus drivers one single thing is important We'll all see hard jobs. Um, even though I find founding and running a company very fulfilling, it's not always easy. Um, so what is important is we all have to find the one thing we love because then it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. And then you have a fair chance to, you know, to have a, you know, a, fulfilling, a fulfilling life. Um, and my dream, well, The ugly truth is, my 30s, so I'm now turning 40 that year, so the years between 30 and 40 were the most productive I've ever had. You know, founding a company, um, still running and successful, um, together with my wife, uh, um, just uh, managed to get two cool kids. It's currently, I'm, um, I don't know. Um, the good thing is, with um, you know, the two kids and the third kid, like Flix, um, they keep me busy, so I remain in the flow. But I know once I may decide to take a break or rechange myself, I first of all will take a couple months to find out what my next dream is. Um, I currently, I, I don't have one. It's just uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to, to live my, my last dreams ongoingly um, and then manage the new when in, I need to. Not yet. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, let me then uh, conclude the event by, by thanking, of course, the Haas Business School for hosting us today. I wanted to thank also the colleagues from MCI uh, Innsbruck for making this event possible. I wanted to thank uh, all of you 
uh, in the audience, both people in person and people who followed us uh, today online. But of course, the biggest thank you goes to today's speaker, Daniel Krauss. Please join me in thanking the speaker. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Shall we conclude with an announcement? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, if you uh, want to join in, there will be a digital live talk this Wednesday, so the day after tomorrow. It uh, will uh, have the pleasure jointly mm -hmm. to welcome the first Vice President of the European Parliament, Otmar Karas, and uh, it will be again on uh, www mci.edu uh, slash live talk and I think there is also a link uh, you will uh, provide mm -hmm. and it is on uh, Europe, uh, Europe and the United States uh, let's win together so let's look forward to uh, the, uh, the, the upcoming Wednesday and the time is one hour later than this one began so it will be 11 Berkeley time and uh, it will be 8 p.m. Uh, European or a Central European time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks. for being Thank with you. us. Excellent. Thank you so much Thanks. for being Thank with you. us.